Welcome to our customization versus configuration webinar. We're so excited to have all of you here today, and we're looking forward to a really fun interactive session. Um, but before we begin, um, we have a few housekeeping items we need to take care of. Obviously, we have the requisite forward looking statements a slide that we put up here. And also just wanted to remind you that um, during the call, we may be talking about some features or capabilities that require additional licensing. So if you're unsure about that, please reach out to your account executive for more information. And also a big reminder, we have a survey at the end of the call that will come out immediately after, and we highly encourage you to fill this out. This really helps us to make sure that our webinars are hitting the mark and we can make improvements on the content or presentation or anything of the sort. So please make sure you fill out that survey. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started here with some introductions, first of all. My name's Brita Koch and I'll be your host today. And I am a ServiceNow employee of almost 14 years. I spent about 10 years in the field as an engagement manager, working with customers like yourselves to implement ServiceNow in their environments. And with me here today, I have Chuck Tomasi, who I'm sure a lot of you know, but Chuck, let's hear what your background is. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Brita, you and I have worked on a couple of those engagements over your, your 10 years. Thank you for all the help that you've given. Uh, I've been with ServiceNow since 2010. I was a customer for a couple of years before that. And my tech and computer and IT industry goes way back into the early 80s. So I think I just passed my 40th anniversary some time ago on on this grand adventure so happy to be here still feel like i'm at the best part of my career for all of that time and we know chuck started his it career when he was two so um <laughs> not quite <laughs> <laughs> but anyway between the two of us you're looking at 26 years of service now experience here um, so we're really happy to be here and share what we've learned over the years but first we're going to start out with a poll we'd like to know you know how feel how comfortable do you feel about your understanding of customization versus configuration. So we have a, a scale here of one to five, one being you're not comfortable at all, five being you, you've got all the answers. So we'll let this poll run here a little bit. It looks like middle of the road is kind of taking the lead here. Um, so hopefully we can move you from middle of the road up to a five by the end of the call. And those of you who are in the, the lower side, we hopefully we can get you moved up as well. Um, so we'll just give it a couple more seconds here to let you fill this out. Um, all right. Looks like we're getting here close to the end. All right. That's a pretty good bell curve. <laughs> that is. Yes. <laughs> and I forgot to warn all of you, you know, because we have Chuck here, we're going to have a lot of dad jokes today. I'll do my best. <laughs> Professional comedian is not on my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> All right, I am going to go ahead and end the poll. We're at 40, 74% of people responding. So thank you for that. And um, so what we want to do next is at the beginning, you know, we asked for you to put in your definition of um, customization versus configuration. So we want to take a look at a couple of these. Um, so the first one I'm bringing up here, Chuck says, for packaged software, customization is when the system slash application is altered and requires special care when upgrades take place. Configuration is when standard options are implemented that would not be negatively impacted during an upgrade. What do you think of that definition? Uh, I like where you're headed. I, I, I'm not sure exactly where that lands. I mean, how do you make a decision of what is a customization and what is a configuration when it comes down? It, it, it feels very squishy and open to interpretation by different people. And that's kind of where this whole thing came from and why we asked that question is because I, I think uh, we've got you know 400 plus people on this call, half of which answered with their questions. Thank you for or, with their answers. Thank you very much for that. And we had equal number of different answers, many centered around, you know, if I have to write script or if I have to change something that's uh, a baseline object out of the box, as some people will call this. and that that again gets into what is and what is not customization and configuration and i i created a blog article a while ago you'll find i get a little passionate about this stuff because it's it's so subjective to say customization and configuration we had at my old company we had implemented a uh, an erp system at one point 
and it was time to replace it about 20 years ago. So you can imagine how that first one went. And they said, oh, we've customized it to high heaven and we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to stick with out of the box. But over time, little requirements came in and they were tweaking the system and changing baseline things. And and it the next upgrade came along and it was just really painful. And since we just had our Vancouver release, everybody's starting to think about upgrades again, right? That's, that's a cyclical thing we have at this company. And by recognizing where these changes are made and how they impact the system before you make them, you, know, you should obviously be thinking about what is the risk? What is the value? What is the maintenance costs? Those are the three things that go through my mind right away is when somebody asks for a requirement and says, I need this. And hopefully there's a, there's a process in place where you go from requirement through a business process, an owner or an analyst, and they turn that into a technical requirement. So the technical people aren't just going willy nilly and changing things left and right. That's where you get your greatest risk. Getting back to the definition, some people say, well, if I change something that's out of the box, well, moving a field on a form is out of the box. You know, right. there's no denying it. You've changed something in the, the SysUI view table, the SysUI element table, the Sys, you know, there's several tables just involved with where is that field placed? How, what are the properties on that? I need it read only. That's out of the box stuff. You go, well, that's configuration because I'm just clicking and dragging. Okay, fair enough. Th then people start going to the other extreme and say, well, it's customization when I have to change code. There are examples that we'll see in here that that you do need to change code. And and I can I can tell you, you know, off the top of my head, there's there's one that stands out in my mind is the baseline service portal page when you want to create a default landing page. You have to change an out-of-the-box script include. Why it's not a property, I don't know. I didn't design Service Portal. I it can't answer all the questions, but <laughs> go go back and ask Nathan Firth or somebody who was there when it was born. Uh, it's just one of those things that you need to be aware of. But you need to understand the risk, the cost, the value, the the you know the overall change. It's not so simple as A is a customization and B is a configuration anymore. Uh, and there are places where we have some words of advice of when you want to actually or have to modify out of the box and when it makes more sense to take a copy of that because our advice has unfortunately changed over the years based on learnings and experiences and we want to make sure that you've got the fastest path the easiest path the least risk to that next upgrade and um i think you've kind of moved into our next topic chuck which all is... over the place <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I didn't think I was going to hope to keep you under control, um, <laughs> but um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the risks and rewards of customization because, I mean, I think when we talk about customization, a lot of times people think, oh, no, it's all bad. Well, uh, maybe it's not. Um, so let's break it down. No, and and that one of the reasons I just, I cringe when I hear the customization word is because some people hear that and apply it to custom apps which is all customization when you think about it. I need a, a bespoke table. I need to create some script includes, some flow actions. This is all, all mine and all custom because nothing came from ServiceNow except the platform on which we build. So I don't want to convolute this customization and custom apps. Custom apps are good. I, I, I build them all the time. I'm working on one right now, custom spokes for doing integration are a necessity when we don't provide something that's available on the store or a vendor or whatever. So I, I absolutely love, I live in custom world. Okay, that's, that's where I get, you know, nobody's writing a, a, a karaoke app on ServiceNow except me, as far as I know. <laughs> if you're out there writing one, let's collaborate. Put it in the chat if you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> or Jeopardy or Family Feud or some of these things that we, we use to show off you know, LiquorBot from Jason McKee. These things that we show the art of the possible to get out of that ticketing mindset and going, oh, we're just a, a, a system of record. No, it's, it's, it's an end-to-end -end workflow engine. And you couple in the AI and whatnot. I don't want to sound too markety on this webinar, but customization is is kind of a misnomer in my world and can be misinterpreted by people. So I I like to stay away from this whole customization and configuration argument because nobody can agree exactly where and what it means. 
and it, it 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 has a connotation around that custom word and can actually deter people from creating solutions and automating processes and digitizing things that really need to be digitized because they've got this fear of customization. Now, I will say when it comes to creating apps or creating uh, custom solutions or modifying things that you need to add on to existing apps or plugins or whatever, there are best practices to observe when you do that. Uh, I created a custom app, what was it, 2009, 2010? When did I, when I got you that said award? 2011, but you know, you, you, yeah. you're maybe spelling. Some time ago in the distant past of ServiceNow, when we were less than a thousand employees, I'll just say, <laughs> uh, I created an app to manage our loaner assets, laptops, mobile phones, you know, chairs. I don't know. We, you could put anything in there. And that application, albeit it was written long before there were scoped apps, long before there was Flow Designer, long before there was Service Portal, long before it, it was it was some pretty hardcore stuff. And it still survives. That app still runs on Vancouver. Okay. Now, granted, I'm in the process of upgrading it, so we're using Flow Designers to the old workflow engine. I don't get back to this thing very often, but it, it needs a facelift. And the script includes the schedule jobs, the script actions that were triggered from there, those all still work because best practices were observed. Uh, I, it, 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 it can be done. That's, I mean, that was pre-Aspen that this thing was made. So we've gone through, what, about 25 releases? <laughs> and this, this app still works. So it's not a bad thing to create a custom solution. If you avoid things like DOM manipulation, you've got a lot lower risk for those upgrades. It survived from, what did we have back then, Brita? UI 11, maybe it was even pre-UI 11, then we had yeah. UI 14 and 15 and UI 16, and now we've got, so it's, it's, it's survived all of this time because there wasn't anything that was undocumented, stuff that wasn't unsupported, uh, and that's that's really where it comes down to identifying the risk and again the value. If somebody says we absolutely need, as Carlene Carter likes to say, this purple button, and we don't have a purple button, but you're going to put a purple button on there. It's like okay, let's help them understand that could have an impact on our next upgrade. That could whoever makes this purple button. I'm using that as a metaphor, of course, but whoever makes this needs to document it and understand how to do this because some poor soul in the future is going to have to come and maintain that purple button because business requirements, as we know, always change. The organization is organic. It's moving around. Requirements are going to change. And somebody says that button needs to be on the other side of the form. Like, Oh, how do I get it there? How do I get it there? Who made this? And instead of going, Oh, grumble, grumble, that was, you know, Frankie's job eight years ago. And, He's long gone. Nobody understands what this purple button does. I had one of those a year ago. We had an integration that was all scripted because it was written prior, 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 where'd that come from? Prior to Flow Designer and Integration Hub. That's all we had was the outbound rest message V2 script. Had to take a couple of large script includes that did a number of things. It was custom code. Not a bad thing. It did its job until it didn't when our provider changed from REST to GraphQL. And I said, I'm not going to go fi figure out what all this does. I mean, I need to understand it functionally, but not to that detail where I could just try to patch in new APIs. It was, I'm going to re-engineer this so another poor soul who comes after me isn't going to have the same problem. So I took it from two very large script includes that were 600 lines long and crushed it down to a flow, a subflow, and a decision table. Now that's something you can reverse engineer very quickly as opposed to discovering what all this code does. So it's, it's clear that discipline is the key around customizations, discipline and documentation. Um, now you did touch on some of the risks around it, but we know there's some risks that are specific to upgrades. And I think one of the first things you wanted to talk about was, um, you know, our, our recommendation around changing baseline code. So um, mm -hmm. I'll kick off with that. All right. You're going to click through this for me? 
I'm, I'm going to click through this. I'm a so clicker. I'm going to go old versus new recommendation and exceptions. So prior to about seven years ago, what we would tell customers is take your original script, include business rule, you, you name it, and make a copy of it. Okay, that's a click. There you go. <laughs> and that becomes your version. Now you take the original and you deactivate it. Now, once upon a time, it would still get upgrades even though it was deactivated, letting you continue on with using your custom script include business rule, you name it, et cetera. When you make changes to this, you get the functionality you deserve. The problem was, we would come along occasionally and upgrade. Somebody using performance analytics did this and went, I've upgraded three times. You're telling me there's all these features out there for performance analytics and I'm not seeing them because they followed this advice and they, they were not using the script include that we had then upgraded. They were a sad face and we had to figure out how to reverse engineer that and detach them from their custom script include, I think it was, and life went on their merry way. So the recommendation we have now, for the most part, if you need to I, you know, identify that risk, identify that value and say, I have to modify something that's out of the box. Okay. A script include for performance analytics, we'll say. Go ahead and modify it if you must. Then as we upgrade, you will get notified by the upgrade center, hey, you've got a conflict here. You change something that doesn't match what we're going to, what we expected. So you can merge, you can skip, you can replace. You know, there's, there's options for you, but it's flagged. Whereas the old school way to do it was not flagged. It would, what, what, what happened? Now, I will admit there are a couple of customization, or excuse me, exceptions. <laughs> I try not to use that word and it keeps slipping out. An exception though. <laughs> There's a couple of exceptions that I thought about on my pre-dawn morning walk this morning. And I went, wait a minute, ATF, automated test framework. We supply these out of box baseline test suites, tests, et cetera. And the, 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 Recommendation. In fact, I don't think that you have a choice. You have to make a copy of that test as it says you can't modify this protection, blah, 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 whatever it is. You make a copy. They're provided as templates, as examples, as starting points for you to then build your own tests. So that one is enforced and that's the recommendation. So I don't know how hard you tried modifying a baseline ATF test you're better off just going to duplicate the whole test suite and I'll start from there. That way you've got your own. Any upgrades that come along later, uh, I don't know if we've upgraded lately, but I know we keep adding on. We provide more examples to more of these processes. The other one that I believe is in place is service portal widgets. So you copy the widget or copy the page and then you can use your own. Again, it, it, if it, it provides you with a fallback example, go, oh, things blew up on my widget. It's, it's not counting things right or, or listing whatever you're doing with your widget. You can always go back to the baseline and say, well, this one worked, but my, all I did is change some CSS and mine doesn't work. Start comparing the CSS or whatever it is that you want to compare. So that one, you do duplicate the, the widgets and the tests for ATF are the exceptions that I can think of for this. Somebody may have some other ones in there. All right. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about those tools about um, to manage these uh, customizations. But first, we've got another poll, of course, because we've got to give Chuck time to have a sip of water here. <laughs> Think of a dad joke. Um, so how does your organization manage customizations? You know, we just talked about having some level of discipline. Um, so, you know, are you at the point where you have a full governance program or are you like have nothing, nada? And um, I'm, so far, I'm not seeing a bell curve on this one, Chuck. <laughs> It'll be it's, all over the map. <laughs> it's yeah, and and that's fine. You know, there it proves that there is some level of recognition for hey, we can't just you know turn people loose. I was in an environment like that prior to ServiceNow. At my old job, I was taking care of their CRM application. I took it over from somebody else, and my predecessor who did the implementation would take any requirement and do it regardless of what oh, it said true. it might it was terrible there yes. were 
there were three checkboxes that basically did the same thing and nobody was using them consistently because nobody stopped to ask, what is it? Do we already have something? Is this just an enablement question? Are we, are, is it something we can solve with process versus uh, the tool? It, it, it just, it was it was bad. It was really bad. <laughs> and then on the flip side, uh, one of my former customers, Jable, they do uh, they send every piece of code through a change advisory board. And I know people at first thought that that was a horrible thing that was going to slow them down, but um, they can take upgrades in a couple of hours. Um, so there is a benefit to that upfront. Oh, work. that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of upgrades, don't forget to upgrade to Vancouver. <laughs> So we're going to give you some tools here to help you with those upgrades. Um, so first of all, um, Chuck's going to talk a little bit about the Upgrade Center, which even a non-technical person can probably understand, right? I just used this about six times on my instances last See, week. A non-technical person can understand <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah, you literally go to the support site and say, I want to upgrade this instance on this date to this release. And it says, great, you're scheduled. And you get an email when it's done. Now, I was impatient, so I logged into my instances, something you couldn't do in the way back days. I mean, when it was upgrading, it was unavailable. Your instance remains available during the upgrade, and you can go to the Upgrade Center and see the process. I should have done a better uh, screen capture for this one. I think I posted it to LinkedIn. It said, you're going from Tokyo patch 9 to Vancouver patch 1. Wow. And I went, cool. And you could see where it is. There's a nice little you know, a thermometer, what do you call those progress meters of, hey, I'm updating the database schema. I'm installing plug in 594 of 733. It, it will tell you where it is. And, and then, of course, send you an email when everything is done. Now, with Upgrade Center, it's simply a point in time of where you are in that process. There are some things you should consider. I'm not going to lay out all the best practices for upgrades, but just some ideas, which we go to the next slide, which I believe is ATF. Yes, is a, we got these in the right order. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, and uh, before you get into that, if, if you have questions yeah. about some of those um, upgrade procedures, we did do a, an upgrades webinar that's available on demand, where I had some SMEs talk about different aspects of the upgrade. And so I recommend that as a good resource as well. So anyway, sorry, Chuck, I'll let you get back to there ATF. We go. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> uh, ATF, if you're not familiar, real quick overview, automated test framework, it's the gift that keeps on giving. It's like a Christmas club, if you remember those. You put a little money away every paycheck, and then when Christmas comes around, you're not scrambling for cash to go buy the gifts at that expensive time of year. If you don't invest in your Christmas club, you're scrambling around going, oh my gosh, I need you know, $1,500 to pay for everybody's presents. Where am I going to come up with that money? But if you sock it away a little bit, that's what ATF does for you. As you build, as you configure, as you construct these solutions, you should also be building time into that project to build the tests to validate. These are functional tests. They're not unit tests, as you, some of you may be aware of in, in, in code land. But these are functional tests to say, if I do this to a record, do I get this result? You can have that attestation either affirmed or rejected. And, and sometimes a negative attestation is the right result. It's like, I need to do this. I better get this error. Great, I got the error. That's a positive test. So again, I won't get deep into ATF, but as you build and, and stick these away, they're not just good for validating before you deploy into production. They're excellent for validating things work before the upgrade. Don't forget to run your ATF test before the upgrade to make sure everything runs. Otherwise, people will blame the upgrade for things that don't run. And in reality, it may not have worked before the upgrade. Like, hey, I made this change months ago and it didn't work. It didn't work, but nobody spotted it. So having those ATF results before the upgrade, everything's green. We love it. Tests are good. You do the upgrade, you run it again, and it will spot those opportunities. Hopefully everything's green. But if it's not, you can go back. Of course, you know, do this in sub prod before you go to prod, blah, 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 blah. You know, these are intelligent people. And if it's not all green, you can always have a green background like Chuck. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Phil McDermott's looking a little the green. The next there. tool we want to talk a little bit about is the instant scan, which is another way to find anomalies in your um, instance before you upgrade. Yes, I love this tool. This is this is something that 
took way too long to get on the platform, in my opinion. It started out about 2012 as a handful of scripts that we used to use in expert services. And we would go to customer sites and do a config review, right? Did a, did a dozen or so of these in my day. And uh, we would give the results back and say, you know, you've got some bad practices here. You, you know, this is scored and, and you know, wonderful reports, et cetera. And uh, that turned into a service which we offered through support. I believe we still have it, a health scan. It was, yes. it was formalized, it was beautified. It, it, over, it, it had many generations of, of evolution to make it much more scalable. Now it's available to everyone. I think as of, what was it, Orlando, Paris, somewhere in there in the last few years, it, it, it became available on all instances. And it's not just for uh, testing uh, your, your configuration changes. You can put in code scans in here to say, do I have anybody using DOM manipulation? Let's flag that as a finding. So you create these checks, much like the ATF tests, you create checks, which are definitions. You run the instant scan and it will, presume, it will produce findings for you. And then you can go through and assess the findings on your own. But it's also good for validating data. How many of us have done an approval flow and it just falls through because the user has no manager? You can use instant scan to validate users have managers and produce findings if somebody doesn't. That way you don't have this automatic, hey, Chuck's ordering a laptop. It gets approved because Chuck has no manager in the CIS user table. Hooray, I can order anything I want. Not quite that. <laughs> so InstaScan is good on a number of levels. There's a huge community out there that that uh, has findings that people are contributing to. Look, look in the community. I believe there's some GitHub repos. I think somebody's even put one on our share portal. Uh, is it Sasha Wildgrub? has uh, lots and lots of great stuff around code scanning as well. Excellent. Sorry, I accidentally moved to the next slide. That's okay. That's a anyway, way to say, move along, Chuck. Yeah, Chuck, wrap it up here. The cane's <laughs> pulling you off the stage, man. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, most of our customers work with an implementation partner, whether it's us or one of our certified partners. And so, you know, how are they going to manage customizations there? Because there's all kinds of different relationships and arrangements that customers have with their partners. Um, so what are some recommendations you would have around this area? Yeah, I, I applaud our partner ecosystem. It has grown phenomenally since you and I started years ago. I think we had what three, yeah, four we partners. Had two or three. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the the when I went to Knowledge Ten, the uh, the partners were at their booths in the hall, and it wasn't like an expo hall. It was the hallway as you walked from one room to the other. Fruition and a couple of others. <laughs> <laughs> right. It was it, it was rather. Uh, humble in those early days and and to see what it has become. So thank you to everybody. Welcome to everybody who's jumped on board. There's some wonderful talent out there. Uh, the, the, the key information I've got around working with a partner is understand as if you owned it. Okay, so I'm working for, you know, what's our fictitious company name? We used to use one in <laughs> training. Cloud Dimensions, I think it was a, okay. So I'm I'm an employee. I'm a I'm a technical consultant or or the platform owner. You name your role at Cloud Dimensions, and we've hired Partner X to help with our implementation because we're new to the platform. We don't want to make any stupid mistakes, and they've done this hundreds of times before. They may have pre-built accelerators. We should know what those are, how they work, get documentation on those. Because at some point, you may be done with your contract and they go bye-bye, and now it's up to you. It could be six months. It could be six years. I don't know. It could be another partner comes in and you need to hand over how that worked. And rather than resorting to name-calling and you know, bad emojis, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's work incredible. together and understand. So treat it like you own it or you're going to own it because you very well may and understand everything they've done and why and the risk that it carries because to simply put in and say hey we've we've loaded this update set and now you've got all of our accelerators so we'll get this done in half the time and they walk away and you go great this works until something doesn't or until you get flagged with a finding 
on an upgrade or an instant scan. You go, I don't know what this is. It partner X did it. And that just that just leads to trouble. Yes. So again, it gets back down to that discipline. And um, you know, I know a lot of times customers get partners because they're they're low on resources, but you still need to invest some time to, like you said, own it. Um, because at some point you may, and it may be at a crisis point, and that's not when you want to be trying to figure out how you own it. <laughs> I have um, found that most customers who, I, I, unfortunately, years later, they, they're doing re-implementations because something yeah. they did five, 10 years ago is so customized, for lack of a better word, that they it's can't upgrade it. Right. They have, it's better to start over than to try and retroactively fix those. And with age comes wisdom. So they go, okay, we know this process better. We know that we want to use the guideline to use things that are out of the box because that will make our upgrades go better. Can we, can we work within those guidelines to, to have a better outcome? Because we're missing this functionality that ServiceNow is coming out. It's very expensive to do the upgrades. It's unfortunate, but sometimes that's the only recourse. So if you can avoid that early and, and start with that mentality, start with that discipline, as you say, you've got a much better chance of achieving long-term value, long-term success. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to have that discipline because there's usually some unrealistic deadline and people just want to get things done. But, it, you know, you really got to take that time and, and have that discipline. Otherwise, it's like you said, it's going to come back and bite you later. Um, we were, we had put custom apps here to talk about this a little bit more at the end, but I, you covered a lot of that earlier. So I didn't <laughs> any other, uh, words of wisdom you wanted to fly about, uh, custom apps before we go um, on to our. I, I know I talked about this and, and mentioned the example that I've got still works 13 years later. It, it, it really comes down to understanding what those technical best practices are. And we have a vast majority of them, albeit they probably need some serious updating on the, uh, developer portal at developer.servicenow.com. There are still technical best practices out there. Um, you probably won't find anything around modern tools because I don't think it's been upgraded in about five years. So I would love to have the bandwidth or a resource to go back and say, here's the technical best practices for Flow Designer. Okay, Consider your actions and your subflows as libraries that you can call from anywhere via script or another flow or whatever. Uh, and and you know, just oddities like that are, are missing and we recognize it. We desperately love to update that and we'd love your feedback if you've got any ideas on what those may be. So when it comes to coding, they're pretty much uh, still rock solid from what we told you before. You know, try doing this instead of that so that you can avoid an upgrade issue. Uh, I mean, as I mentioned, how many times have we changed the, uh, the UI since 2010? 2008, you know, when we started, it, it's, you know, five, six. And yet, if you do things right, you can That's keep, true. you can keep that functionality and the app just becomes, uh, you know, something else in your ATF, it goes, hey, let's test the loaner application, run that suite and go, yep, still works. We're good. Because there's nothing impacted by that, uh, by that upgrade. Nice thing about upgrades and custom applications is you, know, you may be calling a, a script include that comes baseline, and you may also be using some of your own code. I think I had a loaner or utilities to figure out when is it time to remind somebody uh, that they're, it's time to pick up their laptop. Let's trigger an email. All of that was using standard out of the box functionality. I had to write my own script include way back when. But because it's mine, it's not touched by any of the upgrades. Uh, if I had been using an out-of-box upgrade, I want to keep up with the release notes to find out, did anything change in this? Some, sometimes that's as easy as going to system definition, script includes, find the ones I'm calling. Uh, in fact, I believe in Studio, you can now say, where is this called from? And find out or who's calling this and understand who's impacted by that upgrade. And then you can say, well, it hasn't been modified since June of 2009. Still good for Vancouver. Let's move on. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, so we're gonna take a, a break here and have another poll. Um, now that you've heard all this great wisdom from Chuck, 
Um, do you, how do you feel confident now? Do you feel about your understanding of how to handle customization versus configuration? So again, we'll have the, the pull up on a scale of one to five and Chuck, if you wouldn't mind, could you drop in the chat, the link to the developer? That's portal? what I'm after right awesome. now. Sauce. Look at this. We've got a lot more force. The bell curve has moved up a level. Check it out. All right. Well, let's Good. go for a little bit longer. And then after this, we'll talk about a few more resources and then we'll jump into the Q&A. We've got no um, uh, dearth of Q&A. We've got about 35 questions out there. So I'm anticipating we won't get through all of those. Um, we'll try to get through the, some of the major themes and then the unanswered ones we can um, will be posted on the community site for new customers. And so if you go to discussions on community underneath there, there's a new customer onboarding hub and we um, post the answers to the questions in a blog there after the event. Um, okay, so it looks like we're pretty much through the poll question here. We've moved everybody up. It looks like the majority have moved up a notch, so that's awesome. Thank you. Um, so before we move into the Q&A, like I said, I'm going to talk about a few resources that we have available. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we do have some events around ATF coming up. Um, Shamile posted a link to all of our events for upgrades, but these are the ATF specific events. And these are what we call our 360 meetups. And this, so these are customer to customer peer conversations. We will have a, a SME from our platform team online to answer questions, but this is really a chance for you to interact with your peers and get information. And we um, do have one time slot that is friendly for the Asia, our Asia folks there, so that you don't have to be on in the middle of the night. Um, also some additional resources here, a link to Chuck's blog, configuration or customization, wrong question. Hopefully um, he's convinced you of that during the webinar today. And then we have a couple of articles from our customer success center talking about governance, managing customizations in your platform, as well as help managing your partner relationship and your coding, some more ATF resources, our upgrades and release page um, that you may be wanting to refer to since we just had our Vancouver release. And of course, don't forget to register for more of our welcome webinars, which can also be found on our Lab and ServiceNow events page on the community. Um, so I'm sure you're tired of hearing me talk about these things. Um, let's get into some Q&A here. Um, so Chuck, um, first question we have here is, are integrations more often than other areas likely to be customized? Boy, that's a hard one because it's it's a bit like saying, do I need to custom order a car or should I get one off the lot? Uh, it really depends on what you're after. I, I have found that my use cases tend to slant towards building custom integrations. And I am happy as a pig in mud when it comes to building them now. I'm working on one for a URL shortener whenever somebody goes to devlink.sn slash something or other. It's, it's a home-built solution on the back end. I'm not going to make any bones about that. We are moving towards a more commercial product, more supported product that uh, needs a custom integration. So I'm building out the spoke to do that. And just last night I, I saw, hey, they've got an endpoint to give me a QR code for the short link. Build out an action, add it to the spoke, done. I think I was done in less than an hour. And, and that was just being persnickety about a few things going, eh, I don't like this. I had to actually learn how to save an attachment. <laughs> I thought I was gonna have to script it. There's a checkbox on the rest step that says, save as attachment. I went, really? How long? You know, it's, it's one of those things where you never scroll down the form until you have to. <laughs> so I invite everybody, explore. It's just every once in a while, go a little further on the form than you usually do. It's, it's, it's just habit. You know, all developers fall into this. But yeah, that's a good question. I would advise everybody, first look in the store. See if there's already an integration hub spoke in there. Uh, when I was doing the karaoke app, for example, I know we, we were developing a YouTube spoke about the same time. I chose to do my own. And the main reason for that, even after the one that came out, I would, is because of the credentials that it used. Um, the one that we have offers OAuth authentication, which means you've got to have it credentialed to an account and it needs to be renewed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I chose to build one with an API key because I'm a firm believer in system to system integrations are best served with API keys and not with accounts. But that's that's a philosophy of mine. Um, we have another question here of where do you document your customization? Is there a specific tool that you use for that? 
Oh, great question. Um, I would say it's tool agnostic. It could be, if you're writing script, please put comments in the code. I believe in putting a header above every function to say what it does, what are the input parameters, what are the output parameters, um, anything it uses from elsewhere, like this uses a class, blah, 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 or uses this dot something and this dot something else. So it, do document the code. So I'm starting at the low level, working up this, uh, this say this spoke that I'm creating for the URL shortener, uh, I would create a separate document slash PowerPoint, make sure that everybody understands what it does, how to get analytics, et cetera. Uh, just from a usage and an implementation standpoint, I'm also sharing as I go, as I develop with people who have kind of kickstarted this. I didn't start the spoke. I'm building upon somebody else's work. So I make sure that I share back to those people and say, hey, I added this QR code action last night. And they go, great, let me, let me know when you publish it <laughs> so, or, or commit it to GitHub. And then they can you know, then choose to do a, uh, a pull release. The, there's just, there's different, there's another good way. Document as you do your commits to source control or as you add things to the, um, the app repo, uh, the description field on everything everything little known secret there's one on business rules that's not on the form by default you may want to consider adding that to the business rule so you can have a description on your business rules so pretty much everything has a description or a comments field to help you identify it in the system and then an overarching architecture document could be word could be markdown could be whatever you use in your organization to describe how these things are put together and I've also seen customers who use an agile approach document the, the yep. code that's used to support a specific story. And then it's easy to track what functionality is connected with which piece of code. Um, so that's another another tool you can use. Um, we do have a couple of questions around the uh, pre and post 2016 advice. Um, so I want to make sure we try to get that sure. clarified wrap up. So there's a question here, just to be clear, if we use the pre-2016 way copy and deactivate, will the disabled code show in the skipped records or not? It's my understanding that it will be skipped because at some point we went from updating things, even if they were deactivated, to not upgrading them. You have made a change to that, and that was unchecking the active flag. So it will be it will be skipped and you should be flagged on that now. All right. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm like 90% confident on that answer. Don't, if somebody <laughs> want to validate that for me. Um, a, a lot of people are looking for best practices. Um, there is a, um, in the resources that I provided, there is a, um, a article in there. It's called business smart customizations. Yes. That you, um, any other ideas that you would like to throw out there, Chuck? Um, I did paste the link to the technical best practices, or at least one of the pages that I'll get you started with that index on the left. Uh, just pasted it again into the chat. So if you missed it, it's at the, if, if you search for technical best practices on developer.servicenow.com, you got it. So those of you that are not watching at home or watching later, you go, well, I don't see the link. I don't see the chat, developer.servicenow.com. Just search for technical best practices. I believe it's under the reference section because we've got reference, we've got blog, we've got community. Um, but we will we will definitely uh, put that on our 2024 list of candidates of things that need updating. Yes. And then there's a question here. There's a tool to see the impacts on our instance of service now before upgrading. Um, I think we covered that with the instance scan. It's a scan. ATF are going to be your best friends for that. Okay. Um a lot of people asking for the recording. <laughs> um, will ServiceNow introduce more out of the box instance scan checks? Um, I don't think that's one we can really answer. I don't know. If I did, I would say safe harbor, safe harbor, safe harbor. Uh, <laughs> but I don't have any insight to that at the moment. All right, here's one. How do we know in the first place if there's an out of the box feature and that we do not need to customize? Or how do you? convince a customer, if a customer is working on an existing tool for many years and now is going to service now, I think they're trying to ask you like, how do you, and we, we didn't really talk about this too, like knowing the customer's business process flow yep. and do we code exactly to that flow and break the system? Or do we think about, up, you know, uh, modernizing the, the process or thinking through the process so that it, it works in a more efficient way, that sort of thing. 
Um, I think it's, sure. it's, it's very important to understand the as is, the current process that you're coming from, to understand, to get an eyeball on what those requirements are, what their current mindset is, but also help them understand the capabilities of the platform and the value of going to this. Because if all you're doing is re-implementing an old system on service now, I like to call that putting lipstick on a pig. You're not doing anyone any favors. You're going to cost yourself a whole bunch of customization and risk and maintenance, et cetera. And you're going to, it's like, there's a reason they're going away from the old platform. It didn't do something or it caused inefficiencies that we can potentially address, hopefully we address with, with our platform. And the, the classic case I like to give, forgive me if you know, listeners, the Breakpoint podcast have heard this before, but I worked with a process consultant at our old company, Courtney, and she said, I'd like to create a new form on ServiceNow to allow people access to the AS400. And then it would send an email to their manager. They would respond, we'll take that email and attach it to the record so that we have evidence for the auditors who come around once a year. And my mind immediately went, that's exactly how the old system worked. And those auditors took over our conference room for a week every year. I said, <laughs> Courtney, let me show you something. There's this list at the bottom of the form that says approvers. What if we put it there? I didn't, I didn't tell her the whole, the whole workflow. I didn't go into the technical details, but I said, then when the auditors come along and they say, show me the evidence, they could see who the approvals went to, who actually did the approval, when it was, and we implemented, it's standard out of the box approvals, right? It, and this is even the old workflow engine. So it, it, it was proven the next time the auditors came around, I think it was August or September, they were in and out of that conference room in one day. So not only did, was there a, a process improvement, but it was just sort of an ecosystem improvement. Like, yay, one of our precious conference rooms isn't taken over by those grumble, grumble auditors. And it's like they were in and gone. I, went, I won't say it was completely you know, credit to service now that they were in and out so quickly, but they didn't have to search through evidence. They didn't have to open download attachments and check. It's like, that was, that was the old way. That was the inefficiency that we were trying to get away from. Now, getting back to the question of how do you understand what's available on the platform? Oh, trust me, I'm guilty of reinventing these things so many times that I didn't know. I found the community has been my biggest friend. There are a lot of smart and experienced people out there. And if you say, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what my requirement is. Here's what I've found. This is what I think I need. It's, it's the same kind of thing as if you go to Stack Overflow or something. But if you go to servicenow.com slash community and ask your question in a polite, professional way, you will get many suggestions that go, oh, hey, by the way, there's already a script include called Array Utils to do that. Why write your own? Like, oh, good. Didn't know about that. Uh, might even be helpful to go through the documentation once in a while and say what script includes are out there or go to system definition script includes or, you know, that kind of thing. Do some exploring, do some personal growth and learning. That's how I've, I found a lot of these things is just, I, I created this backlog of content that I will never get through because I just went through and said, do I know what this does? Let's go read the docs on it and, and go, dang, that's pretty useful. I'm going to keep that in my back pocket for some day. It is so hard to keep up with all the innovations that we're making on the platform that you really do have to take that time to educate yourself. And it, it's difficult to do because we all have day jobs, yep. um, right? Um, I have a pretty good example. I think of a customer who wanted to kludge our code as well. Um, I had a customer who in their previous system had combined um, incidents and service catalog requests into the same form. And they wanted to do the same thing when they came to ServiceNow. And I basically told them that they would be losing any value of coming into our platform if they didn't fix that. And they're like, oh, well, we, you know, we we did that in the old platform and we were always going to update it. And I said, well, you were on the old platform for what, three years and you never fixed it. And now you're coming to service now. Why, why would you do this again? <laughs> I, I love this quote that, that Spike put in the chat. Yes. A fool with a tool is still yes. a fool. Get your process nailed first. Oh, I, that's a t-shirt waiting to happen. Yeah, is it a <laughs> Oh, uh, golly. So we're going to have time for one more question here. Um, I'm going to try to pull one out of here that we haven't um, answered yet. Um, a lot of people asking about the deck and the recording. Um, somebody wanted did ask if um, the uh, workflows and um, flow designer were considered um, customizations. 
if you are modifying something that's out of the box, I mean, again, it, it, it's that <laughs> your definition of customization versus mine. Oh, it's just click and drag. That's a configuration. Is it? Is it really? <laughs> you are you are changing something that we provided. There is a risk. I will say that. Not that not that these things change that often, uh, but we are making a migration of many of the old legacy workflows into flows. And over time, you may find that oh, you know, this this isn't working the way I expected. Or or my my suggestion would be to to create your own. Just make a copy. You can you can duplicate a, a, an entire flow or even a, a subflow, et cetera, in, in mere seconds and then start as that as a baseline. Just want to put a little plug in here for our impact um, product. So if you want additional help from ServiceNow, this is a service, a product that we offer that it has a wide range of different capabilities that can help you, particularly around some of the areas that we talked about. And last but not least, you know, please make sure you re register for more events. Um, you know, we're, we're always adding to these events to try to help you along your ServiceNow journey. So we thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Chuck, for all your insightful answers. My pleasure. Have you a good day.